the audience for tuning in. It is a privilege to be speaking with you today. Allow me to give you a little bit of context about my job and we'll get right into it. Um, so uh, my, my job is the leader of the consumer business for Grubhub. Um, Grubhub is a food delivery leader in the United States. We're a pretty large company. We on average feed more than 500,000 people every day in the US. Um, we sold more than $6 billion worth of food last year, uh, so, so a pretty large operation. Um, we also have a pretty significant marketing budget. Over the course of the last year, we spent more than $250 million on various forms of advertising. And uh, uh, one thing that I'm very passionate about, one thing I wanted to talk to all of you about today is, is all of that spent, is all of that effort actually making a difference? Um, and and uh, I will postulate that two things actually determine whether, whether uh, they are making a difference. This concept of incrementality and this concept of alignment of incentives. Um, I will talk about both of these in some detail uh, and uh, I I'll leave a little bit of time for questions towards the end. But first, I want you to understand uh, why this really matters for Grubhub. So we're a food delivery company um, and uh, this means that it's quite expensive for us to acquire customers. We spend tens of dollars to acquire a customer. And then on an individual transaction basis, we make three, four bucks if everything goes perfectly. So we are your ultimate LTV business. On one end of the spectrum, there are folks selling mattresses because you sell a mattress, you make a lot of money, right? And that customer probably is not gonna come back for a good seven years. You sell food and you do a good job, that customer is gonna be ordering from you a lot. Um, and a, a, a ordering many times and your amount of profit that you're gonna make per transaction is actually fairly humble. So uh, for some of our most loyal customers, they're ordering once a day or even several times a day. So uh, this idea of LTV, lifetime value, is extraordinarily important. Being able to predict who are the customers that we're gonna get, what is the quality of those customers, like what's their LTV gonna be like, and how does that compare to cost of customer acquisition really matter for our business. It's a matter of life and death. It is just so very easy to give out coupons, set money on fire to drive growth, but that growth is not profitable growth. Ultimately, what we're after is profitable growth, which means invest a certain amount to acquire a customer, and then over time, make that money back and then start making the profit. That's the definition of profitable growth. Okay, uh, now that you know why this matters so much, uh, I wanna to talk to you about these, these two levers that we have used over the years uh, to try to maximize the output from both our effort and our dollars. And the first concept I wanna to talk to you uh, about is this idea of incrementality. The core idea here sounds like this. If you weren't doing what it is that you're doing, what would have happened anyway? For example, we as marketers love this idea that, hey, we do a campaign and that same day and the next day we watch what happens. We watch this spike in traffic or we watch the sales. Um, and we, just like all humans, tend to attribute whatever is happening to our actions. Well, in many cases that actually turns out to be a faulty assumption. Um, I'll give you one, one example to kind of highlight how easy it is to fall into this trap. Let's say, uh, uh, let's imagine this conversation between a couple of people working at Gap, right? You go to gap.com, you very often see a big banner at the top that says 30% off. Um, and if you're the marketer running that campaign, it is just so very tempting to say, hey, um, a lot of people saw that banner, then afterwards they redeemed with uh, redeemed the, the, the coupon from that banner in a thousand transactions. And um, th th that's why that thousand transactions, all of those thousand are actually what our coupon drove. But that actually is quite faulty because some portion of that thousand would have transacted anyway. Some portion of that thousand is looking at your coupon and saying, hey, thanks for 30% off. That's really awesome. But I was planning to buy jeans anyway. So the idea of being able to tell what portion of the spend is truly driving incremental behavior is, is this idea of incrementality. Um, 
and, and uh, much of this, I think, is quite intuitive, right? Uh, and those of you who have done A-B testing before, I'm sure find this concept really familiar. So um, let's talk about how exactly you do this in the situation of that coupon, if you're that marketer at Gap.com, how can you tell how many incremental transactions um, were, were, were driven? And it's actually fairly easy, right? You show the 30% off coupon to some customers, you don't show it to others, and then you observe how many incremental transactions per customer that saw that coupon came in from the coupon watchers. And what you'll discover is that it's not 100%. Not 100% of those transactions are, are incremental, but maybe 10, maybe five. So what seems like, hey, cost per incremental customer, cost per incremental transaction being 10 bucks, in reality, it actually might be 100 bucks. So incrementality makes an enormous difference in the efficacy of your spend. And in this example, of course, it's a coupon spend, it's concessions. Uh, uh, but but, but um, the, the same exact thing applies to media. And let's talk a little bit higher in the funnel, right? Um, it's super easy to measure incrementality in the product or in these lower funnel channels. But as you go higher in the funnel, it becomes more and more difficult. For example, let's talk about SEM, Google marketing. Um, so very often you see brands bidding on their own terms. For example, Grubhub bidding on the keyword search for Grubhub. Um, is that a good idea or a bad idea? Well, um, Google will tell you, you need to bid on these terms because you are going to then defend against competitors showing up for your keywords. Okay, brilliant, sounds great. Um, Google obviously is gonna tell you this because they're gonna make more money if you do that. Uh, but does it actually produce incremental orders? How could you actually tell? Because surely when somebody searches for Grubhub, even if you're not bidding, you're gonna appear really high in search results. Even if say DoorDash or Uber Eats are appearing in the ad slot, you're at the first organic spot. Is it worth it? Um, only rigorous testing can answer that question. If the only thing you look at is averages, so average cost per click, average cost per new customer coming in from, 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 from these brand terms, you're going to see amazing costs. You're going to say, you're going to see the best cost per new customer, lowest cost per click for these terms. And it might be so very tempting to say, all of this is coming from these, from these um, campaigns, but that's just false. Because if you turned them off, a meaningful portion would have come from the organic result. So the only way to truly tell is to run an A-B test. Um, in many cases, you um, with, with, with marketing channels, it's very difficult to run a true holdout test. Uh, it's very difficult to tell Google, hey, show my ads for 50% of the audience, don't show my ads for the other 50%, and let's see what happens. It's much easier just to turn them off and observe what happens for a couple of weeks. It's not as rigorous of an A-B test, but you're gonna get a sense for it. And what you're gonna find out when you run tests like this is that good 90% of the clicks that you were getting in your paid result, these cheap, amazing clicks, you now capture in your organic results. And suddenly these amazingly low costs, these low averages of cost per click that you're seeing on your branded terms become 10 times more expensive. That is the true incrementality of these branded SEM ads. Now I'm not saying that they're a bad idea. And in fact, if you Google Grubhub right now, you're gonna see our ads. And the reason for this is because when we've done this calculation and we saw the cost being 10x, it is still worth it for us. It might be for you or it might not be. And I encourage you very much to run similar tests. So as you can tell, you go even a little bit higher in the funnel and it starts being much more complicated. Let's go even further up in the funnel, right? The higher towards awareness you go in the funnel, the more difficult it becomes to measure true incrementality. Let's talk about the ultimate upper funnel channel, television. Okay, television is really good for creating broad awareness. But how in the world can you tell what incremental benefit is television actually having on your business? Because nobody clicks on the TV ads. And it is just so absurdly difficult to tell 
that a customer after seeing a TV ad has gone ahead and placed an order. Because most of the activity that happens after, after somebody sees a TV ad actually happens days later. Sure, there's some immediate response, but you're trying to capture the totality of your CAC. It is so absurdly difficult then to try to, to try to answer this question. And yet you have to, because if you're trying to generate awareness, TV at a certain level of scale is a great way to do that. So at GrowPub, we actually got, have gone through this exercise a couple of years ago, and we were able to, with uh, statistical rigor, answer how much incrementality is TV driving for our business. Uh, and with statistical rigor, say TV is better or worse than say billboards, is better or worse than say Hulu ads. All of these obviously create awareness and it's really difficult to do holdouts of audiences and compare one person to one person from, 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 from these groups. And yet you have to, because this media is so expensive and it's so important. You can't just blindly say, hey, my audience is uh, on average watching television, so I'm gonna be on average buying television. Because um, as, as we just discussed, it's the incrementality that matters. Okay, how in the world do you do this then? How in the world do you tell that um, someone watching TV is afterwards, possibly a week later, when they search for food delivery, is more likely to click on Grubhub and actually transact? Really tough question. Um, so uh, I think the answer that, that we landed on and the methodology that we've been using since uh, is, is the concept of geo experiments. We also call it sister market tests, which is basically this idea of um, trying to create something as close to an A-B test as possible. What's behind the concept of an A-B test? Try to isolate all of the other variables, right? And run as clean of a statistical experiment as you could, separating audiences without bias. That's the core of the idea. Can we simulate this somehow? Um, and the answer that we landed on is yes, we can, if we use geographic areas for this. So here's a simplified version of this. Uh, and if you're interested, I'll go into a little bit more detail. The simplified version is, is as following. You take a couple of cities, say Seattle and Portland. These cities need to have a similar population density, similar competitive situation, and similar weather, because it turns out that weather really matters for food delivery. When it rains, everybody orders food delivery. And then for these two cities, you do the following experiment. For one of them, you bombard it with the stimulus that you're trying to understand. In this case, television. You can do the same exact thing with billboards. And when you say, when I say bombard it, I mean uh, make such a large investment, multiply, multiply your spend in that city, in that channel, by 5x. And uh, the intended result is to be able to see a change in your order volume, in your new customer volume from space, the total change. And what you're going to see in your statistics is suddenly Google is working much better. We get all of this organic traffic. Uh, SEM is working much better. Google ads are working much better. Facebook is working much better. Um, and it's going to seem that suddenly all of the other channels are working really hard for you. The reality is it's all coming from television. So the method there is to take the totality of the activity that's happening while you are bombarding the city with, with a stimulus and attribute the increase, and you can calculate that increase comparing to the other market, take the totality of the increase and attribute that to your TV. You, of course, know the costs. And then from that, you can calculate your cost per new customer and cost per incremental order. This is the mechanism that we've used to judge the efficacy of television, as I mentioned, against, say, um, digital video. And we were able to, with confidence afterwards, and yes, it does take a lot of statistical rigor, with confidence say that the old, boring, stodgy cable television that nobody watches is actually extremely effective. Uh, and as a result of those tests, we've reallocated a meaningful portion of our media towards television and from spending almost nothing on TV, we over the course of the subsequent 12 months became a top 200 spender on television in the US. And you can track that, Nielsen has that data. And you can also track our growth. We're a public company. Our growth has massively accelerated as a result of that.
So um, being able to do experiments like this and answer questions like this with rigor allows you to have a meaningful edge over your competition because as, as I'm sure you, you, you all have observed, the state of the art in terms of media allocation is, um, is, is quite sad. Uh, that is, there's a lot of uh, um, uh, misaligned incentives and a lot of tools that um, frankly don't work. Which brings me to the second point that I wanted to discuss with you, alignment of incentives. Here's what I mean by this. Um, let me ask you something. Have you ever had your Facebook agency, people who are buying Facebook for you, come to you and say, your Facebook spend is terrible. You should spend less money on Facebook. Have you ever had your Google rep come to you and say, Google is not working well for you. You should spend less here. Well, if you're like me, the answer is absolutely not. And I, I can, can pretty confidently predict why, because these people are making a percent of what they sell you and their incentives are not to maximize the efficacy of your spend, but instead to maximize your spend, to make sure that you spend more on Facebook or more on Google or on whatever channel that you're buying through them. So by definition, if, if you have an agency for a channel, their incentives are not your incentives. And I'm not saying that the Google rep or the Facebook rep, that they're nefarious, not at all. They're not intentionally trying to mislead you. But if you're not looking at the total picture, and if you don't have people who are actually incented to try to maximize the efficacy of the total spend across all channels, well, um, in that case, your investments will be suboptimal. Um, for this exact reason, over the course of these three years uh, that, that I've been in Grubhub, we've insourced almost all of our media buying and almost all of our execution. Because um, since we spend so much, and since marketing is such an important part of our business, we simply have to have these aligned incentives. And this has helped tremendously. Um, it wasn't just about insourcing, it also was about aligning the incentives internally, because so many of the marketers come from the same background. And if I'm a marketer owning Facebook, it's embarrassing for me to come to my boss and say, hey, uh, we should spend less here. Because so often we judge our importance in the organization based upon the size of the budget that we, that we manage. Uh, this is up to us as leaders in the organization to set the right incentives for the people that work there. And if those incentives are about maximizing velocity of learning, or maximizing the shared good, then your chances are meaningfully better. And the way you can actually uphold that as a leader is catch your people doing something right. Catch one of the folks who's actually raising their head and saying, this experiment didn't work, or this spend is actually suboptimal. And lift them up because that kind of behavior actually helps the group as opposed to helping the individual. And it upholds those, um, th 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 those aligned incentives really well. So uh, you heard me talk about th this couple of concepts, this idea of incrementality uh, and this idea of aligned incentives. Uh, I encourage you to think through how those apply for your business. But in the meantime, uh, I will take questions uh, if you have them. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alex. I appreciate you speaking. Uh, do we have any questions? I don't see anything in the Q and A, and I would love to, to you know, have someone drop some questions there. Alex is here for you, so it'd be wonderful to you know utilize him. Uh, in the meantime, I do have a question myself. Uh, are there? You mentioned that many tools don't work. Um, you know, you, you talked about insourcing. Um, are there partners or agencies or tools that that can help with things like? incrementality, uh, performing A-B tests, audience analysis, uh, et cetera, um, or it, it is in-house really what you need to do? My advice for any company operating at our size is to actually do this in-house and to have data scientists who are able to do this analysis. Uh, you can outsource this to a separate agency on a staff augmentation model effectively. As long as that agency has zero incentive to try to get you to spend more on one channel, there's a better shot that they're going to be more objective and we'll have aligned incentives with you. Excellent, thank you. 
Uh, any questions from the audience? We still have about three or four minutes. We can take one or two questions, I believe. Well, since I'm not seeing anything and I'm all out of my own questions, I will thank you, Alex, for joining us and uh, sharing your insights with us. Uh, will you be available? We have a networking lounge uh, with a couple speaker tables. Uh, are you going to be available on one of those speaker tables afterward for a while? I actually fear not as I have a hard stop uh, at, at, the, at the 30 minute mark. However, uh, I do have a website where I explore a lot of these concepts in detail, alexweinstein.net, if you, if, if you feel like checking that out. Uh, leave a comment or two if something, something is interesting. And uh, I speak fairly often, so I do encourage the audience to um, find me and send me out. Awesome, and sorry, what was that website once again? alexweinstein.net. And I just dropped that in the chat so that other people can see it and click right on it. Thank you so Thank much you. for joining us, Alex, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Everyone else, Thank please stick everyone. around for our next session. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.